everyone. This is Jackie Cooper. I am both Crypto Mom 2 and I am also the talk show host for GBA Global and I'm very excited to be here. So I want to share today that um, GBA Global has kicked off its talk show and um, GBA is an international nonprofit professional association who focuses on members of both individuals and organizations that are interested in promoting blockchain technology solutions to government and does not advocate any specific policy positions. Today and throughout the time that the GBA talk show is going to be going on, I will be interviewing members within the GBA as well as those within the blockchain community. And if you have questions about anything that we're talking about, definitely write them in. Um, we will answer them and we'll do follow-ups. And also for everyone who is listening, definitely like and subscribe. Um, all the uh, individuals who I'll be talking to, I will have their links below. So that way um, you'll be able to reach out and participate in things that they're working on, their passion projects, because again, all of us are involved in a really um, engaging community and we all want people to participate and take action. So I, a little bit about myself, my background, I'm an attorney, but I'm also a special educator and I've been involved in the blockchain community for over four years. And I am passionate about education and um, sharing information with all ages. I've written a book series called The Bitcoin Cinderella. It's the first of many that I'll be writing, but my whole focus on doing these talk shows is to provide education and information on complicated issues that we might not always understand. I know myself included. And so I'll be asking questions, especially if I um, have a feeling that, you know, some of the terminology might be technical, um, but these are important things to know. So my special guest today, actually, um, I'm looking at the platform right now and I'm just blown away because um, I'll be showing it in a second. It's called Our Chain Cooperative. And um, I, I really don't even know where to begin with your background because it's so diverse. And Greg, I really want to thank you for being on here. I'm going to um, allow you to kind of just share a little bit about yourself. And then we're going to talk about um, what our chain is and the reason for it and the passion project behind this whole area. So thank you so much for being on and how are you doing today? Hello, <laughs> I'm doing well. Thank you for asking and thanks for having me on your show. It's a, it's an honor and a privilege. Uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I often describe myself as a poor, stupid mathematician and musician. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I kind of got into this uh, kicking and screaming um, um, uh, because I, I, I see that there are problems that we're all going to have to face. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I've worked on um, the mathematical foundations of um, concurrent computing for a very long time. Um, uh, so I worked with Samson and Bramsky uh, at Imperial College. Uh, and then took my PhD research to Microsoft, where I was the uh, principal architect behind BizTalk Process Orchestration. Um, BizTalk was very successful in 2004. It was uh, voted um, product of the year. And uh, BizTalk uh, um, came with the idea of uh, internet scale smart contracts about 20, 15 years before um, <laughs> uh, Ethereum. Uh, and they were deployed <laughs> uh, and working in the enterprise for uh, quite some time, very successful. Um, but of course, Microsoft did not understand uh, decentralization. And so, um, you know, I continued to push that angle. And when uh, an entrepreneur approached me about a social concern that he had, um, uh, so he, he was he was staring at uh, sort of the, the, on the one hand, the um, the income inequity and or, or the wealth inequity and uh, and uh, the uh, panopticon of the social media platforms. So Facebook can see everything about us, but we can't see very much about Facebook, right? So he felt that that was just like you know a recipe for disaster. <laughs> and I think uh, Congress has now <laughs> begun to believe that that's the case. So. I kind of got into uh, blockchain backwards, uh, you know, as we, as we began to discuss uh, 
what a decentralized social network might look like. Uh, I, I kept saying, well, but how is it going to be paid for? And if you have a centralized payment solution, that kills everything. Uh, so then I looked at then I looked at Bitcoin and I looked at Ethereum and I realized that none of those platforms would scale. Um, and said, well, I kind of know how to make this scale. And so I said, well, let uh, well, you know. At a certain point, I said, I'm going to have to build the uh, the blockchain part of this first before we can contemplate building uh, a decentralized social network. So that's kind of how I got into it. Um, but around that time, uh, well, I mean, for, for many years, actually several decades, but I began to realize that that uh, blockchain was a, uh, a, a coordination tech, a, a social coordination tech uh, par excellence. And and that we need a social coordination technology right at this juncture because climate change is sneaking up on people. They, they don't really realize how fast it's happening and, and that it is happening. Um, and there are a lot of uh, a, a lot of challenges that people are going to face that they're unaware of. Um, and so blockchain provides a means and mechanism for dealing with some of the short-term challenges as well as some of the longer term uh, social challenges. And so our chain was conceived to um, not only provide a scalable blockchain, but, but to provide scalable global coordination technology so that we can uh, stealth assemble uh, to meet some of the challenges that are coming towards us. That's a, that's a, lo a long story there, sorry. to. No, I love it. I love it. There was a lot of terminology that I'm going to break up um, and ask you about only because there might be listeners that are not as... Um, technically knowledgeable as you and I, and I remember when I first started, some of the terms were, you know, it kind of whizzed over my head. And now that I've been around for a little while, um, there's some terms still whiz over my head, but then others I'm understanding of. But before um, I ask you those questions, I'm going to kind of um, have uh, the, the website um, in front of us. And I will definitely, um, uh, you know, talk about this, um, you know, in terms so, sorry, of- I should say, I should, I should say to your listeners that the, the, the cooperative itself has dissolved. Yeah. Um, we kind of, we, we hit, uh, we hit an, an impasse uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the membership really uh, did not want to see us um, working with enterprise. Uh, and so they, uh, uh, whereas the co-op felt that that uh, working with enterprise was definitely the way to go, rather than being beholden only to uh, the sale of the rev token as the only in, uh, revenue stream, uh, so uh, that uh, that struggle within the co-op resulted ultimately in the the uh, uh, dissolution of the co-op. But the technology is still quite active. There are many groups that are using the technology. I myself am using the technology to solve uh, the need. Uh, business needs of enterprise clients, um, which I, we can get into in a little bit, but, but the technology itself is absolutely uh, still very much uh, uh, there for people to use. Uh, and I would, I would recommend people get engaged. So um, I, you, when we, you first started to give your background and everything, one of the things that you talked about was smart contracts. I know that as an attorney, when I first started, I kept thinking contracts, it's something in paper. And no, it's actually not. It's, <laughs> it's not, it's coding, it's coding, you know, it's, and it's giving directions, you know, for certain things to happen. So, um, and I, I love math. And as soon as I realized, oh, well, that's, you know, the formulas that are happening, it's, you know, like three plus three equals six you're going to give and it's really basic there but you know again um so for someone who's listening uh how would you define smart contracts and how do you you also talked about the the fact that um this our chain is um something that can help businesses with certain solutions and it can also support in terms of um uh, helping in the climate change area how, how how is all that happening do you want to expand on that yeah absolutely so so with respect to smart contracts for for us smart <laughs> contracts uh, are, are simply um programs that run uh, directly against the blockchain so um so the, uh, our, our chain has a um technically it's an interpreter but you can think of it as a as a virtual machine um, uh, the state of which is maintained 
uh, by the uh, on the blockchain. And so every every step of the virtual machine, every execution step, and all the storage is uh, um, maintained uh, uh, on the blockchain, uh, and that guarantees that all the all the nodes that are running the network they all agree on the compute and the storage that has taken place even though they're scattered throughout the internet does that make sense yeah it makes sense to me and um so again for someone that you also talked about the idea which i agree with you of the difference between decentralization and centralization and you talked about how that sort of is a conflict when you are looking at certain things. Do you want to expand on that area? Because again, you were talking about um, how different philosophies kind of work together and then also don't work together. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for, for, I was just simply looking at when, when I was talking with this uh, entrepreneur who wanted to do a decentralized social network. Um, I was simply looking at it from a very pragmatic point of view, as opposed to a philosophical point of view, right? You know, it like the, the any network or service that wants to be decentralized but has a centralized payment part of it, just ultimately can't be decentralized. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's true. You know, that's true. Yeah, it's sort of the the buck stops at wherever you centralize, so to speak. Um, and uh, <clears throat> um, and, and, and but but from a uh, again, if if we avoid kind of political or or philosophical um, um, considerations and simply think about resilience, um, you know, I in in the context of climate change, um, one of the things that makes uh, blockchain interesting, even even Bitcoin interesting. I mean, although Bitcoin is kind of the architecture from hell, um, uh, the. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, the reality is what what makes what makes me as a computer scientist and a software architect sit up and take notice of Bitcoin is that it has a working um, a notion of uh, a, uh, a leaderless um, economically secured distributed consensus protocol. Now it's a mouthful, but what it what, what it is is it's a um, um, means of exchanging messages amongst programs that don't uh, that don't trust each other to all agree on a particular value, uh, and so uh, kind of what makes what makes uh, any project that calls itself a blockchain actually be a blockchain is is this this form of leaderless distributed con economically secured distributed consensus um, protocol, and um, uh, in in if you think about, you know, kind of the uh, the consequences of having such a protocol, uh, one is that um, you know if Russian gangsters decide to take down some Bitcoin nodes, well, ten more can spring up somewhere else in the world. Or if you know the Chinese government decides to take down a bunch of Bitcoin nodes, you know, a hundred more can spring up somewhere else in the world. So there's a kind of resilience um, that this uh, this distributed uh, protocol uh, makes uh, possible. Now, in the context of climate change, where we're going to be facing um, climate-related disasters and climate-related disruptions to infrastructure, this kind of resilience is very attractive. Uh, and I think we need to think very carefully about the sorts of disruptions that we will be facing. If I might just sneak in just a, a, few, a few facts about that that I yeah, don't think people are, are aware of. Um, so the, the recent IPCC reports have suggested that we blow past 2.7 degrees Celsius in about 30 years. Right. Uh, now that's that's disastrous, right? That That is awful uh, to, to reach that uh, that kind of temperature rise. But in, in fact, at, the, um, at roughly the halfway point, so 1.5 degrees Celsius, no one in the scientific community now currently believes that we're going to prevent blowing past 1.5 degrees Celsius. There's nothing we can do. Everybody could stop driving cars and flying planes and, and all the manufacturing processes, you could do it all instantly and we're still gonna blow past 1.5 degrees. That ship has sailed. The problem is that past 1.5 degrees, the tropical zone around the planet becomes uninhabitable. The temperature and humidity conditions 
uh, become such that uh, you your sweat doesn't cool you off. So you don't even know that you're dying. Um, and now the other unfortunate uh, fact about that is that uh, about 40% of the world's population currently lives in the tropical zone of the planet. So we're looking at a mass uh, climate migration of about 2.8 billion people in a very short time frame. Uh, so we're looking at about 15 to 20 years before we're starting to see the failure of the infrastructure in that geographical location be so great that people start moving en masse. Um, now, if you think about it, uh, the Syrian refugee crisis, um, which also uh, many people argue uh, was, was climate uh, caused, that was just a few million people and that caused massive global disruption. The dis dislocation of um, uh, 2.8 billion people is going to uh, be dis so disruptive to society that we have no understanding of what that's like. And because and, and, and so again, if you think about just the current Russian-Ukrainian war, that's one conflict, one conflict alone. Uh, well, Ukraine produces about 40% of the world's wheat. Um, and so the war has put about a third of the planet in food insecurity, right? So the most of the Middle East is looking at famine and starvation unless Russia and Ukraine can get their shit together to get the wheat out to the market. <clears throat> um, now imagine how many conflicts will break out if 2.8 billion people are gonna have to find somewhere else to live. So that's the kind of disruption that we're gonna be facing. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. If you go and look, you'll, you will discover that we're now looking at about 80% of insects by biomass are gone. I was gonna so. ask, you were talking about people and what I was thinking about, and people are very important, but I was also thinking, okay, what about all the other animals and all the other um, you know, ecological systems that are impacted because everything is so interconnected with each other that if you you know if if it's impacting people then it's obviously impacting the animals which then kind of has a domino effect you know has a knock on effect ripple, right like yeah a ripple effect exactly birds eat insects fish eat insects bats eat insects right like the whole the whole um, uh, food chain is massively uh, impacted right so if we lose the pollinators for example we lose right. our crops. Right. <laughs> so, so, so the the situation is much, much worse than people are 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 currently aware of, and 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 what's going to happen is massive disruption to infrastructure. So, while I very much applaud and appreciate the work like uh, of people like Elon Musk or John Doerr, um, uh, uh, who are working on reducing carbon emissions, I think others of us need to be focused on very short term stuff. What do we do about massive infrastructure failures? Because they're going to happen, um, and they are happening. Uh, uh, um, this summer, uh, Rogers uh, Network went down. The entire, uh, all of Canada suddenly had no phone service. That means no 911 calls, no ATM networks were working uh, for an entire day, right? Uh, in Europe, because of the heat, the um, uh, many data centers just went down, boom, gone. And that's just going to happen more and more and more. And it will be both because of heat and uh, flooding and fire and dust bowls, but also uh, because of conflicts. Uh, so so the, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict is going to look like a walk in the park by comparison to what we will be facing. And so, uh, we want to make sure that we that we still have the ability to coordinate socially, and that's where a resilient uh, compute infrastructure that spans the globe can be of service. Uh, so I'll, I'll give one quick example and then shut up. No, no, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. You're um, while you're while you're talking, other questions are popping up. But keep talking. So, so um, while our chain was in operation, so it was it was governed um, by the co-op model. That means one member, one vote. The tokens that we used were to provide the security for the network. They were not governance tokens. Um, uh, but uh, 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 um, 
when the pandemic hit. So in, in 2020, um, like so, so the co-op uh, has a vote at, annually or had a vote annually uh, to elect the board, vote on items of business, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and when 2020 rolled around by, by July, I said, look, we're facing a global pandemic. It's hard enough for us to all come together to vote anyway. So we're just not going to meet, but we're gonna, we're gonna provide an on-chain voting mechanism. So uh, we, uh, I gave the community some algorithms and the community without anyone in charge built a system called our vote. And our, our vote uh, uh, made it possible for, um, for the cooperative to vote um, so that you know, nobody knew uh, how uh, someone voted unless they, they revealed that themselves. Um, uh, they, it, you could, anyone could vote from the safety of their own home as long as they had an internet connection. And as soon as the polls were closed, the results were in. So now if you compare that, those features, um, and so from 2020 onward, uh, our vote was used to do co-op governance, right? So to vote on, on, on matters, and it could even be used to, to do polling. Um, so that's the kind of uh, mechanism uh, that, that I'm suggesting is available for self-organization of any group globally. And so if you think about, if you compare what happened with the US presidential elections to a voting system like our vote, right? So with the US presidential uh, uh, elections, which by the way, cost billions of dollars to, to run and to get numbers about that is very hard because the states are, are very, very uh, closed mouths about the actual cost of running an election. Um, but uh, uh, for those billions, the taxpayers faced some realities. Uh, many elderly people were standing in line to vote in red states for hours during a global pandemic. And then the, uh, the collation of the results took so long that the losing party could lie about the results to the point where there was a violent insurrection against the Capitol, right? So none of that would be possible were we to roll out a secure blockchain-based voting system. It would cost the taxpayers far less, like orders of magnitude less, and all of that money could be spent on education or climate change or what have you. Uh, and, uh, and at the same time, they would be saved. They could vote from their own home and know the results as soon as the polls closed. And if anybody lied uh, about the results, they could just go to the blockchain themselves and check the results. They don't have to trust the government or anything. And that's one of the beauties of decentralized self-organization. I love that idea. I'm going to interrupt you just for a quick second, but because uh, there, I know there's a lot of things that we're going to be talking about. But on this idea of using the blockchain, which I totally support from the voting perspective, I also am aware as an educator that there are many families, both young and old, um, and old, I keep myself in that equation, but um, who don't have a computer, who um, might not have internet, who might have a cell phone, but maybe not the most modern one. So as much as I love the idea of the blockchain from the voting perspective, how do, and, and this can apply to other countries too, not just ours, because there's, and like you said, there's sometimes the internet is on, sometimes it's off, depending upon grid systems. How do we, if we are looking at possibly integrating blockchain to have a more secure voting system, how do we counter those um, areas of friction and include those that might not be tech savvy or know how to do this? And that's why I still like sometimes the paper and pen, but it's not always effective. So how do we solve this problem? So I, I think I think those are great questions. You know, I mean, what, what, what springs to mind immediately is just with the savings that we would have on the election costs, you could buy everyone a small iPad. <laughs> iPad, right. <laughs> Everybody could get a, a little iPad and, and that would be sufficient for them to vote. Yeah, true, yeah. true. Uh, um, um, no, I mean, there are all kinds of questions that one has to ask is you have to make sure that 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 hardware hasn't been tampered with, blah, blah, blah. But um, but it, it certainly to me, if I think about where I might want to spend tax dollars, uh, especially election tax dollars, I'd love to spend my tax dollars 
uh, in such a way that everyone was enabled to be able to participate uh, um, in uh, uh, US democracy uh, uh, from the safety of their homes um, or wherever they wanna be, but not having to go to the polling locations, uh, especially when there are health concerns. Like right now in Seattle, the air quality has been terrible. Um, and I'm still coughing because it's been so bad. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's not a good idea for people who are, have their, um, their uh, uh, health challenges to be out in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, this kind of air right now. So th those are things that I, I think are uh, um, of value that the blockchain can render both immediately and also as we uh, come more and more under the shadow of the consequences of climate change. Yeah, I think uh, a, I think a rollout approach might be definitely feasible, especially as um, you're you were training, educating people. So you know, again, for those that um, don't have the computer access, they could go to the polls. Maybe for those that do, they could do a blended version, a hybrid version, just like we did as an educator. We sometimes did hybrid learning, Zoom, and also in person. But let's go back to the climate side of it. Um, you know, so we talked about voting as a possible area that the blockchain can support. What other ways can the blockchain support um, the impact of climate change? I know one thing that comes to mind right away is like what happened, you know, when there's a hurricane and a disaster weather-wise, you know, all the records are lost you know, right. uh, and the blockchain can secure and facilitate having access to those records. But what are the, I know you're a visionary. So what I, are- the, Actually, like, actually I, I, I would take issue with that. Okay. Without, without um, a, uh, a blockchain like our chain, which scales to the point where you can put significant data on chain. I mean, I mean just to give you a sense of what our chain could do, uh, in our testnet zero, our chain demonstrated storing audio data on chain and delivering it from chain in real time. Uh, uh, this last uh, summer, we demonstrated storing video data on chain and streaming it from chain. There's no other blockchain that can do that. So, so, so I mean, if you try to store a song on Ethereum, it's going to cost you millions of dollars. You, you can't do it. Uh, first of all, Ethereum is just not scalable enough to store audio data. Like, you know, you couldn't build a decentralized Spotify on top of Ethereum uh, or Avalanche or Cardano or any of the others uh, because they don't scale and their, their financial model is not set up to address those kinds of data needs. So the existing chains aren't really designed for Web3. Our chain was designed for Web3. So it's all about being able to store things like uh, health, uh, health records uh, on chain, um, your COVID test results uh, on vaccination results, those kinds of things can be stored on chain and people can manage them and still have their privacy. So even though the data is on chain, they can still be made private uh, and only available to the person who holds the private key. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think that if you think about the way the internet uh, grew up, um, it didn't start off, bang, suddenly everybody was connected. Yes, <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> what happened was you had lots of little intranets, right? So inside universities and companies and, and uh, uh, NGOs and things like that, they had their little intranets. And then the value of being connected overwhelmed the concerns about security. And so they started connecting, right? And once they were, once they were connected, uh, then you had what we know and love today collectively as the internet. So a scalable blockchain is going to work like that. Um, and this was really at the heart of the disagreement with inside the co-op. So what I have argued, and you, you can look at my article in the economic standard that I wrote with Ralph Banco. What, I, what I've argued is that we just follow the internet. Just, just, just like there were a lot of lessons learned about the growth of the internet. Let's just apply those. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so so, uh, so the, uh, the, the first thing is 
um, uh, our chain uh, is sharded. So you can you can build little private versions of an R chain network. Um, and uh, you can deploy those for enterprise solutions. So for example, um, soft supply chain is a great place to go uh, and deploy um, a, a blockchain. Uh, so for example, uh, print news is certainly, you know, it, it's not uh, at the top of everyone's priority now because people can just go check uh, uh, YouTube or CNN or uh, any number of, of online resources uh, to get their news. So print news is not um, not at the top of everyone's list, and yet people still buy print news. Um, and uh, and but no one's going to die if you know the the, uh, the latest uh, tabloids don't make it to um, the supermarket on time. Uh, people will die. Uh, for example, if a uh, pallet of drugs is delivered to the wrong place or the wrong time. And so I make a distinction. I divide markets in terms of risk. Right? So you, you want to go uh, for new technologies like the blockchain. You want to go for lower risk markets and prove things out at scale. And by the way, Web 2.0 taught us that, right? Google, you know, nobody died if Google's search results weren't perfect. The first time, uh, but what 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 is costly about um, a system like that is the scale. Getting it to scale is where most of the uh, technical challenges are, and then once you get it to scale, so that people, so that millions and millions of people can search all at once, twenty four seven, right? Then you can start going after uh, more risky things, say like Gmail. Right and again, people aren't necessarily going to die if an email is dropped on the floor, but uh, but you know then then Google and Facebook and others have shown that if you first take softer things out to scale, and then you can go after the harder things. And so this has been uh, the R chain go to market strategy, which is to build lots of uh, enterprise solutions for markets where people won't die if the network hits a hiccup. And then if you get enough of those, then people want to connect their, their solutions together. And then the public network arises out of that. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. It makes total sense. It does. Because again, like you said, there's a varying tiers of areas of risk and needs. And when you're uh, introducing something new, um, you're, there's always going to be hiccups and you have to work those things through in a way, like you said, where it's less risky. And, 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 and then also, as you said, you know, it's a question of the masses adopting this. If they run into a challenge, a friction point, that's when they get frustrated and they say, I don't want to do this anymore. So it's really important to um, make it as, as user-friendly as possible, but you can't do that sometimes unless you actually go through the process of using it and realizing what's not friendly. So- Absolutely. And, 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 and building on that idea, just as you, as you were saying, um, if you could get blockchain to infiltrate the supply chain um, management side of things, so you start with the soft supply chain stuff, and then you move out to more mission critical things like medical supplies, uh, scheduled substances, uh, um, uh, um, uh, mission critical electronic parts, uh, uh, um, logistics, things like that. Then suddenly you now have a resilient technology, right? A disaster resilient technology that's threaded throughout the global uh, compute infrastructure, so that. So that, it, like for example, if we talk about the Rogers network or the data centers in Europe, if the if the uh, network had been decentralized, like our chain is, then several nodes could go down, and ten more nodes would pop right back up in place to to replace them, even though the data center went down, right? And so you get resilience in the face of these kinds of of uh, disasters, whether they're conflict related or climate related or some other kind of challenge. And so this, this is the idea is you, you, you push the a blockchain 
slowly into the supply chain uh, and so that it replaces a lot of the existing supply chain infrastructure so that the supply chain infrastructure can be resilient against these climate dis uh, related disasters. And that, and that then fits with the work that people like John Doerr and um, Elon Musk are doing, right? So they're doing things uh, to, uh, to mitigate, the, to, to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, Musk is doing things like, like Starlink is a great idea because even if there are earthly challenges with respect to telecommunications, uh, a, a satellite network is, is, a, is a great fallback position. Uh, uh, for um, for the the basic uh, connectivity, and then if you have a, a blockchain that fits against that kind of uh, um, uh, you know resilient or robust uh, telecommunications infrastructure, then you have the um, then you have the supply chain and coordination technology that will help us get through the challenges that we're going to face. So that's in a nutshell, kind of what the Archain vision has been. No, I love it. Um, so I know that for those that are going to go to the link, you're going to see um, on the on the platform. There's it has different drop downs. They have platform, ecosystem, white paper. There's a blog. There's a lot of really great information for people to see. Um, if someone wanted to get involved and actually try to integrate this, whether in their business or learn more about it. How, what would you recommend to them? Because there is a lot of information here. Um, how would they take the first step? You know, you know so, so uh, there are a couple of different articles. Uh, like recently, uh, yesterday, I was talking with uh, someone who had taken a significant interest in our chain um, and, uh, and they wanted something to read. And, and so the article that I published this summer on, uh, at the Economic Standard with Ralph Benko, um, uh, so, so I don't I don't think that that's yet uh, it, it, uh, on the website. Um, it, it it might be. It's, it was certainly tweeted out by our chain, uh, but it, but later I can put the um, uh, we can put the web the links in the in the uh, YouTube link description, uh, and then also um, Hacker Noon. Uh, so Ralph and I wrote an award winning article, um, or at least it's been nominated for awards at Hacker Noon. Um, <coughs> Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that also describes the system. And then if you go to the website and you look at, uh, the tutorials, uh, you go to the GitHub, uh, look at the source code. And then if people want to write to me, they can write to me at, uh, lgreg.meredith at gmail.com. And I'm happy to, to, to help people get involved. Yeah, I, I'm I'm scrolling through. So people who are on the YouTube side are going to see me scroll through. For people that are on um, the audio side, um, definitely we'll have the link, and that way uh, you'll be able to reach back out and ask. Um, I really want to go back, uh, circle back around to the climate side, though. Um, what else can we do to um, support in a small way or a larger way? Um, both individually as well as through the use of blockchain, um, what 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 where do you see that we need to reach out and actually be active in? So, so uh, you know, one of the things that my eighteen-year-old son pointed out to me this year is that you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the media that that actually does talk about climate change tries to put the burden on the consumer, the individual consumer. But that turns out to be just massively false. Um, the, the reality is that that the armed forces of, of various nations and the biggest defender of all is the U.S. armed forces. They have one, one of the largest carbon footprints ever. Um, and one thing that we can do as voting citizens is to ask that all government, all taxpayer funded vehicles be uh, electric vehicles. Um, by a particular date, right? So like 2030. Uh, and that combat um, uh, vehicles, um, you know, pick another date, like 2040. That all of those vehicles must be electric by those dates. Um, and, 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 and that's as simple as voting uh, and writing to your Congress people, writing to your senators. Um, uh, in, in, in general, you know, there, there's, there's simple things that we can do. Uh, not, not everyone, uh, 
can make these lifestyle changes. But si since I was 11 years old, I've been a vegetarian. Um, uh, I'm a beekeeper. Um, uh, for uh, a good long time, I restricted my air travel uh, to reduce my carbon footprint. So there are lots and lots of things that people can do. Um, uh, but, but you know, uh, I, I also recommend that, that people, you know, not try to take it on all themselves because there are, um, there, you know, there, there are large agencies that uh, are big offenders and uh, we control those with our votes. <laughs> we definitely control those with our votes. I know that electric vehicles right now, um, there, and again, I'm thinking I, I have a hybrid, but I know that electric, there are pros and cons from the perspective of how many miles. Um, also, you know, the, the, the batteries and things like that. I know that there's the more that we get involved with the electric vehicle side, the more it's going to develop so that way it can um, actually self-generate, you know, having solar maybe on it, and that would be great. I know personally, um, like yourself, I'm a vegetarian, so that, that was a personal choice, but I also decided this year, um, finally, after many years of research, I decided to, um, to do this. I now put solar on my house. And so, you know, again, um, and, you know, full disclosure, I'm a solar affiliate. So if anyone needs any information, you do not need to, there's no money out. So, and you can switch your, your, and you get a tax credit right now. So reach out to me. I'm happy to, because if each one of us does a small, you know, that pebble, the ripple, is everyone can make a small difference in our own community. So I figured, okay, the solar was something I could do one by one. And that what you know, that that was something I could take a bite out of. You know, that elephant, you got to take a bite out of something. So yeah. um, but again, I agree with you. We um individually within our local area, we need to think about how do we make a difference? And then, like you said, voting is critical. We need to um, step up to the plate and and share, you know, share our opinions. So that way, collectively as a whole, we're heard. Um, I want to thank you so much for being on. We talked about so much. I know there's so many other conversations that we can have. Uh, for anyone who's listening, definitely the links will be below. Um, Again, you know, my name is Jackie Cooper and reach out to me through GBA or through Crypto Mom 2. I'm here to bring people like Greg to um, the, the talk show who can answer questions, even raise more questions because these are questions that we need to be thinking about. And there might not be a simple answer, you know, and this is an evolving situation, um, but in an evolving community, there is so much going on. So um, any last minute thoughts that you have before we sign off today? Well, again, I really want to thank you for, uh, for, for speaking with me. The, uh, one other thing that I do think people need to be aware of uh, that I think that blockchain and crypto um, have an important thing to say about. And that's the um, CDBCs, the central bank digital currencies. Um, those could be a social nightmare uh, if people think through the implications of those. And decentralization is another piece of the puzzle that has to be put into that public discourse. And maybe on some other show, we could talk about that. <laughs> I would love to. Um, yeah, because you know, centralized digital coins or currencies, they're a whole nother animal. And uh, so definitely, uh, we can definitely have more than one conversation. And I'll just, you know, also share that um, our talk shows are not financial advice, they're not legal advice, they're educational. You have to do your own research. You have to get, you know, verification from more than one source. Um, and that's why that's one of my pet peeves on the media side is that, um, you know, again, people kind of just take sources from one area and not the other and not verify facts. Um, again check it out, you know, make sure you know the, the, the root of the source that you're listening to. But thank you so much for being on. I, it was an honor to have you on. I'm so excited to be learning more about the platform and what it's doing. And I can't wait to see where it goes next. So thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao for now.